So what is Poton actually made of? The classical narrative is simple. It's two up quarks, one down quark and bunch of gluons. We know this from 1968, but there is a little problem with this view. At LAC, physicists collide protons to create exotic particles like Higgs boson or Z boson. And they succeeded, otherwise they wouldn't be able to claim discovery. But what we are really colliding? We know the proton is made of quarks, which have a fractional charge. But if we are colliding protons, we are colliding quarks. But how can we create something that has a zero charge from these quarks if you want the charge conservation law to be satisfied. The numbers just don't add up, so how could physicists create any Higgs boson or Z boson or any particle that has an integer electric charge at LHC colliding protons? You might say that we are not colliding quarks, but gluons, since we know that gluons have zero charge, and therefore the charge conservation law would be satisfied, right? The problem is that gluon is a mediator of a strong force, and it only fills particles that have a non-zero color charge. And only particles that have a non-zero color charge are quarks. And therefore the direct production of Higgs or Z boson from gluons is forbidden, because neither Higgs nor Z boson have a color charge. It is the same as with photon, because photon is a mediator of an electromagnetic interaction and therefore it only fills particles that have a non-zero electric charge. And neutral particles are basically invisible to it. The answer to this question lies in a vacuum. Because according to quantum field theory, particles in a classical sense don't exist. There are only quantum fields that are everywhere, even inside the proton. And excitations of these fields are what we call particles. So the proton is not just U, U, D and bunch of gluons, but it's made of basically anything. Extremely rich and complicated dynamics is going on inside the proton if you take a look at it from the close distance. And it only looks like three quarks from the outside, as all the messy interactions average out. And if you look at it from even further away, you only see a point particle with integer electric charge. And this is the magic of energy scale. Because protons behave differently at different energy scales. And what I mean by energy scale is, for example, the energy at which we collide the protons. If you collide them at low energy, they just bounce off of each other. And the fact that proton is made of quarks is basically hidden from you. And therefore you can freely use a point like charged particle description to describe these interactions. So at low energies, protons scatter off of each other just like electrons, although they have a higher mass. If you however collide protons at higher energy, the dynamics of the internal structure becomes important and the results of such collisions are vastly different and therefore the description of a proton as a point-like charged particle becomes inaccurate. And you know that there is something going on inside a proton. As you're increasing the energy of the collision, even the three quark approximation is not enough, and you are discovering more and more about the internal structure of the proton. And it is not only two up and one down quark that make a proton, it is also charm, strange, bottom, even top, and all their antiparticles that proton consists of. To give you some intuition about why we need different descriptions for different energy scales, you can imagine a simple rock. If it's small, let's say about one meter in diameter, it is a solid object. And therefore we have to use the description for solid objects, because the strength of the interactions between the internal atoms is much stronger than any other possible forces. The forces among atoms are however constant, which means they don't change if you make the rock very big. But the strength of other forces, like gravity, are not constant. And therefore if the diameter of the rock is few thousands of kilometers, it starts to behave like a liquid rather than a solid object. It collapses under its own gravity into a ball 
as a drop of water would do. And if you just dropped it at some imaginary surface with some velocity, the strength among atoms would be negligible and the object would simply behave just like a liquid. This energy scale phenomena is just simply consequence of the fact that certain forces depend differently on certain parameter. In the case of the rock, the binding force among atoms remained the same with the radius of the rock, but the internal forces caused by gravity increase with the square of radius, and even though they were negligible when the rock was really small, with the increase of its size, they become the dominant factor and the system just behaves in a totally different manner. And it is similar in the case of protons. At low energies, the electric force between two protons is dominant and it behaves like a point particle. But as you increase the energy, this strong force starts to play the dominant role. And that is the point where our description as a point-like particle starts to differ and we are discovering more and more exotic stuff going on inside the proton. The funny thing is that top, bottom, even charm quark are heavier than the entire proton. So basically you could say that proton is made of things that are heavier than itself. But of course this is a huge oversimplification. The mass of the proton can be calculated using quantum chromodynamics and the result just matches with the experimental value. So saying that the physical top quark is inside a proton is not accurate, but the quantum field that is responsible for the existence of top quark is inside the proton and it contributes to the internal dynamics of the proton and therefore mass of the proton. After all, the mass of the proton is only given by its dynamics because the constituents like up, up and down quark are just simply too light to explain the mass of the proton. So if you want to calculate the production cross-section of two protons to Higgs, then you have to calculate it separately for each quark and anti-quark combination. Each combination gives you contribution to the total cross-section, which depends on the energy at which you collide the protons. But wait! We know the energy of the colliding protons, but it is quarks what we are colliding. So we don't really care about the energy of the entire proton. But how can we know the energies of the quarks? But this is just impossible because the dynamics inside the proton is just so complicated that there is no way to know the energies of the quarks prior to the collision. Yet we somehow know how to calculate this cross-section, but how? Well. The special relativity is here to save the day, because time dilation phenomena. Usually at LHC or at any accelerator, the protons are highly relativistic, and therefore they see each other's clock very slow. And therefore the distribution of partons inside the proton doesn't change much during the collision. So the protons see each other just like a screenshots of partons, and we don't have to deal with the dynamics. But during each collision, there is going to be a different screenshot of protons. And there is no way to know which screenshot there is going to be during particular collision. But what we can do is at least experimentally find out the probabilities for a particular screenshot during particular collision. But this also depends on the energy at which we collide the protons. So basically for each energy we have to determine these probabilities. These are called parton distribution functions. So what is it? For a given total four moment of a proton, each parton carries different fraction of its total four momenta. So we can create a graph where we plot the probability density for finding a certain parton carrying a certain fraction of the proton's total four momenta. As you can see, for all the partons except U and D, there is a high probability of finding these partons carrying a low fraction of the proton's total four momenta. And there is a peak of finding U and D quarks carrying one third of the total four momenta. 
we call them balanced quarks. If we increase the total four momenta of the proton, then these peaks start to disappear, which means that the valence quark play less and less dominant role over other partons. So, if this video was helpful to you, please give it a like, and if you are interested in particle physics more, especially how physicists detect new and exotic particles that have a lifespan of 10 to the minus 25 seconds, then you could watch this video, and I see you next time.